This is a short video I made on an idea I briefly covered in my The Men Behind the Curtain episode, which you can find a link to in the description below. I'm working on a longer video series, so I thought I'd upload this as a kind of filler episode and also as an opportunity to unpack and explore an idea I think is intriguing but didn't really get to flesh out in the Men Behind the Curtain video. In this episode, I'll be looking at the tyranny of the majority. So, what is the tyranny of the majority? What does it mean? And where can we see it in contemporary political culture? The idea of the tyranny of the majority, sometimes referred to as the tyranny of the masses, or as the Greeks called it, ochlocracy, which essentially means mob rule, is an idea that stretches as far back as the ancient Greeks all the way up to political thinkers such as John Stuart Mill and Alexei de Tocqueville. In short, the idea is that a situation can occur whereby a majority group places its own interests above the interests of a minority group, without consideration for the welfare or rights of the minority group. The idea of the tyranny of the majority is a problem inherent in democracy, whereby the majority chooses the outcome of policy and governance that affects all. So, a minority group may be left behind in the decisions undertook by the majority, as the policy that the majority want to see enacted might not necessarily benefit them. Now, a minority group is a charged word that we come to associate with race, gender, sexuality, etc. But the minority group could also be a minority group of oligarchs or political elites. So, let's take a look at both sides of the coin on this idea. An example of this theory in history was the period of slavery in the pre-Civil War era of the United States. You see, during the time of slavery, all of the American electorate were white and free. So for them, keeping slavery legal was in their best interests. It wasn't in the interest of most of the electorate at the time to abolish slavery. So therefore, the voting majority used their power to keep slavery from being abolished and to keep slavery as part of the status quo. Only the minority wanted slavery abolished, and they were almost always ignored by the majority who wanted to uphold slavery as it served their best interests. But whilst the interests of a marginalized minority group should always be lauded, there is another side of the tyranny of the majority idea that disturbs the global order and Western hegemony to such a degree that the West has overruled democratic practices in order to maintain their hegemonic dominance. An example of this that happened more recently in history is the Algerian Western-backed military coup, who overturned the election results in the 90s after the Islamists won, which also draws comparisons with the Muslim Brotherhood seizing power after the 2011 Arab Spring and the Iranian Revolution. All of these events happened after one power was ousted and by utilizing democracy, the will of the people voted in reactionary religious fundamentalists, something which did not please the Western elites and would potentially disrupt the global order. To counter this, the West either backed coups, paramilitary groups, insurgencies, or, as in the case of the Iranian revolution, deprived them the opportunity to participate on the world stage. These cases show, for better or for worse, that democracy is only upheld when it is a neoliberal government in power. Conversely, we also saw this instability and radicalism domestically in the case of Trump, who stoked up white nationalist rhetoric once more, and Brexit, which again fanned the flames of xenophobia and nationalism. But as these reactionary figures and movements maintained and furthered the neoliberal status quo, the radicality and instability of these movements were dismissed. Now, the elites don't like it when the results don't go their way which is why the tyranny of the majority has been a thorn in the side of idealistic ideas on democracy for some time, as it can have troubling consequences for both minorities suffering under the rule of the majority, or it can unsettle the political and financial elites when the will of the people demands change that uproots economic and political foundations. Thinkers like Aristotle, John Stuart Mill and Madison fear the tyranny of the majority for similar reasons. In their view, the poor majority could be swayed to vote for confiscatory legislation that seizes the wealth off of the rich minority at the upper echelons of society, therefore creating an egalitarian proto-communist society. These thinkers thought the best way to counter the tyranny of the majority was to only grant democratic practices to the rich and well-educated members of society, 
which I guess kind of undermines the whole idea of democracy in the first place. But as the cases in the Middle East show, this idea is probably closer to the conception of contemporary democratic practices, but in the inverse. I.e. everyone is allowed a vote and the vote will be accepted only if the well-educated and rich members of society are kept in power. Right, returning back to the men behind the curtain video, I talked about Tocqueville's perspective of the tyranny of the majority, so I'll dive into that a little more. Tocqueville is most well known for his publication Democracy in America, whereby he visited America to undertake a sociological study of democracy. You see, when he was writing this book, democracy was still a very new and radical idea amongst the European elites. So Tocqueville wanted to see the huge democratic experiment firsthand. He describes majority power in a democracy as such. The moral dominion of the majority is based in part on the idea that there is more enlightenment and wisdom in many men combined than in one man alone, more in the number than in the choice of legislators. Consequently, the minority admits it with difficulty and gets used to it only with time. Like all powers and perhaps more than any other, the power of the majority thus needs to last in order to seem legitimate. When it is beginning to be established, it makes itself obeyed by force. Only after living under its laws for a long time do you begin to respect it. Furthermore, Tocqueville fears the tenacious and unrelenting force of majority rule. He later writes, in the United States, the majority has an immense power in fact, and a power of opinion almost as great. And once the majority is formed on a question, there is, so to speak, no obstacle that can, I will not say stop, but even slow its course and leave time for the majority to hear the cries of those whom it crushes as it goes. We must remember that Tocqueville was writing this as a Frenchman, visiting the new land. Democracy in France was still fraught, unpolished and being refined. America in its conception was a young, new, constitutional democracy. Something that had never been tried before on the scale of America. The tentative feelings of uneasiness and hope were really swirling around his head. At the time of writing his work, France was a lone renegade amongst Europeans. As most of Europe was still governed by absolute monarchs. Whereas the monarchic societies of Europe were viewed as a holy ordained sacrament and maintained a top-down implementation of law, democracy had put forth the idea of a bottom-up rule by majority, which was far more unpredictable and more likely to be swayed by emotion and hysteria. So, how does the idea of the tyranny of the majority fare in modern times? Well, in short, the tyranny of the majority the elites feared has been pacified and, in a way, weaponized against us. There is this genuine collective rage amongst the majority at almost all times in history, and this rage used to be acted out in the ballots or mediated between unions and politicians. But then those institutions who were once the voice of the majority lost their inherent power. There is little representation or reason these days, and the rage we all collectively feel for things to be better is often utilized to be used against one another. Essentially, the privileged elites fear that democracy for all will enact revolutionary consequences for all those at the top, which is the ideal on which it was conceived upon, and is something we've all forgotten. Democracy is revolutionary in its conception. It is for the people, by the people, and serves the people. Instead, what elites have since been doing is suppressing the inherent power that is found in collective democratic action for some time. Nowadays, we can see that the tyranny of the majority has taken a different form. With misinformation and the dissemination of propaganda, the tyranny is now the mobilization of the majority through visceral rage, racism, emotion, conspiracy and suspicion. The collective has now been divided and atomized, so that the tyranny of the majority is now the sway of public opinion and emotion that is played daily through 24 hours news cycles, doom scrolling, social media and advertisements. The elites have pacified the tyranny of the majority to best serve their interests and to disregard ours. 
They no longer fear us turning on the rich minority because instead we are turning on each other. The tyranny of the majority has been subverted to exercise another old as time power play. Divide and conquer. We are now voting against our interests. Instead of our rage being directed at the financial elite, it is directed at one another. The tyranny of the majority in principle has been used against us to dismember the majority, atomize the populace and allow the upper echelons of society to continue business as usual. What Tocqueville predicted, that rule by majority can be swayed by emotion and hysteria, has come true. But not how he probably imagined. The emotion and hysteria is purposefully whipped up by the elites as an apparatus of power and is often used against us to rile us up about trivial things rather than the things that matter. Tyranny of the majority was once something the elites feared would come for them, but it didn't. Yes, the majority rule of people still often vote against the minority. We still have populist anti-immigrant parties and far-right rallies. But the elites have turned our collective gaze to the wrong minorities. It isn't the immigrant down the street that has deprived you of opportunity and social mobility. It is instead the minority at the top of society. The 1% that have stripped our countries, our futures and our security bare. And as long as our collective gaze is always looking at the other and not the elites, they will continue to rule. They will continue to manipulate the collective emotion and hysteria and they will continue to win. The tyranny of the majority is now weaponized anger toward our kin and not to those elites that rule. Thank you for watching. Look out for some more videos coming up very soon. Please check out my podcast over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting me on my Patreon at patreon.com slash haikoop. And if not, follow my Twitter at hi underscore coop. For further reading and show notes, check out my website below. This has been Haikoop. See you all soon.